Good evening, I'm Diana Swain, and this is The National. Canadian forces get a budget boost, a big one, the day after the government redefines its foreign policy. If we're serious about our role in the world, we must be serious about funding our military. So how much and for what? Why are you not answering these questions? Tense testimony in Washington over Russia's potential election interference and secret conversations revealed between Donald Trump and the FBI director he fired. Plus, comparing kids drinking cow's milk to kids drinking milk alternatives. Who's coming out ahead? It's a huge amount of new money with few details about where it will come from. But the government says the boost to Canada's defense spending is overdue and will modernize and make Canada's military robust. It's an increase of 70 percent over the next decade. 14 billion additional dollars to a total of nearly 33 billion. What will that new funding buy? More soldiers and more special forces. And the government wants more women in the military, hitting 25% of the Canadian forces by 2026. There is money to get 15 new warships built and to buy 88 new fighter jets. Our government has fully committed to making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces are going to be on a sustainable footing for the next 20 years. The U.S. has been leaning on allies, including Canada, to meet the NATO spending target of 2% of GDP on defense. Does today's announcement get us there? Here's Murray Brewster. This is an important day for the Armed Forces. There were congratulations all round. Almost 14 months in the making, the Liberal government's vision for the Canadian military arrived today, all 93 pages of it. The review is an exhaustive, sometimes thoughtful look at where the military fits within Canada and what it can realistically do in the world. It is loaded with a lot of soft Liberal goals, diversity and inclusion, health and wellness for the troops and their families. But it is the dollars and cents that preoccupies people in uniform and the politicians. The important thing to note here is that uh, our government uh, is committed to making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces um, are, have the sustainable and predictable funding. I think the, the, the costing, the funding they've provided, it's real if it's actually there in the four years when most of this really kicks in. It's not like we haven't been here before. I'm therefore pleased to announce that the government has decided to set aside stable and predictable funding for this plan. The previous government announced a lot of things, didn't put the kind of money forward in stable, long-term, predictable ways, and that's exactly what we've done. Where's the money going to come from? I will be uh, talking, you can talk to my colleague. I think that's the appropriate place to talk to him. He told us to talk to you. As with any government, there is massaging of numbers. The Trump administration wants all NATO countries to spend 2% of GDP on defense. Under this plan, the Liberals say they'll get to 1.4 percent, drawing qualified praise. In all aspects, it looks to me like Canada is confident that you're not biting off more than you can chew. But there is one big asterisk. DND says it has been underreporting what it spends on the military, and it's now including direct payments to veterans, the cost of administering defense programs, and more in the numbers it reports to NATO. I think, uh, to their credit, they, they fudged the accounting structure, uh, but they at least did so in a transparent manner so you can, you can see exactly how they fudged it. Even with all of the money the Liberals plan to pour into defense, there are still big-ticket items not on their 20-year list, namely replacing the Navy's second-hand submarines. They will be upgraded and sail until 2040, at which time they'll be over 50 years old. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. So how many NATO countries do spend 2% of GDP on defense? Just five of the 28. The United States, Greece, Britain, Estonia, and Poland. It was a scandal from the moment three Canadian bank employees first spoke out about pressuring customers into buying products they didn't need or couldn't afford. And after they told their stories to CBC News... 3,000 more came forward with similar accounts. It was enough to prompt MPs in Ottawa to get involved. And today they heard firsthand how the upselling was ordered and carried out. Erica Johnson has more. Call the meeting to, uh, to order. 
The star attraction at the Finance Committee's hearings into Canada's big banks, a longtime former employee from Scotiabank, who listed off a myriad of ways bank employees would upsell customers to generate sales revenue. The one that ter- disturbed me the most was approving people for much larger mortgages than they could afford. Anything to raise the profit of the bank, whether the consumer could afford the product or not. The hearings were called after three employees from TD Bank contacted CBC to reveal what they call incredible pressure to upsell customers to meet sales targets. That led to more than 3,000 past and present employees from all the big banks reporting increased pressure to generate sales revenue, act unethically to sign people up for products without their knowledge, steer them into investments that make the banks more money, and sometimes even break the law to meet sales targets and hold on to their jobs. Practices MPs heard have actually been going on for decades. I think what's shocking is how long this has been going on without anybody ever making a fuss about it. And I think it's time a fuss was made. The committee is also hearing from bank employees who've submitted emails but want to conceal their identities. One teller at TD Bank writes that workplace success is almost solely about meeting sales targets. I strongly urge you to tell banks that they can't tie sales targets to job security because that is definitely not in a customer's best interest. An advocate for investors testified by phone saying these hearings are a good start, but not enough. They really do need a public inquiry. They need to listen to some of the thousands of witnesses who've come forward. Representatives from the banks themselves are set to appear before the committee on Monday. Earlier this week, MPs heard from the bank's umbrella organization, the Canadian Bankers Association, which said it takes seriously allegations of a pressure cooker sales environment, but it downplayed the size of the problem. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. As Erica mentioned, this story all stemmed from three Canadians getting in touch with Go Public. You can contact them too if you have a story you think they should look into. You can email the team directly at gopublic at cbc.ca or through their website. Coming up, the night before the British election, Margaret Evans brings us up to speed on the unusual campaign. And I'm Yim Kirksal with the painful lessons from a divided island. What Cyprus can teach us about the nationalist sentiment growing around the world. Well, this week, there is a storm in Washington ahead of the testimony of James Comey, a swirl of speculation, accusation, and political fireworks that might never have happened if Donald Trump hadn't fired the former FBI director a month ago. Today, Trump announced a candidate for Comey's replacement, Christopher Wray. Wray is a private attorney who's counted New Jersey governor and prominent Trump ally Chris Christie as a client. But before that, he was a senior U.S. Justice Department official in the mid-2000s. During that time, he worked alongside Robert Mueller and James Comey, both key figures now in the investigation swirling around the White House. Bars are planning viewing parties. U.S. networks have countdown clocks running, and Donald Trump himself is widely expected to tweet a flurry of responses as Washington braces for James Comey's testimony. But as Paul Hunter explains... A big part of that testimony has already been released, and it's already... To ease up on his investigation into talk the train colluded with Russia to meddle with last year's vote. One of their meetings was a week after the inauguration, a one-on-one dinner at the White House. In the statement, Comey writes, Trump said to him, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. It was awkward, says Comey. We simply looked at each other in silence. Comey, who three times says he told Trump he himself was not under investigation, says he explained to Trump why it's important that the FBI be independent of the White House. Two weeks later, writes Comey, after a crowded meeting in the Oval Office, Trump cleared the room, telling people he wanted to speak to me alone. And when it was just those two, he says, Trump said, I want to talk about Mike Flynn. Flynn's the former national security advisor who then had just been fired for lying about contacts he'd made with Russia and is now under a broader investigation. He's a good guy, said Trump, writes Comey. I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go. In a phone call a few weeks later, says Comey, Trump said he himself had nothing to do with Russia. And as Comey puts it, he asked what we could do to lift the cloud. 
tonight on Capitol Hill and beyond dismay and fury. Comey confirms that Trump asked him to end that investigation into Flynn. That by itself is almost a Watergate level effort to interfere with an ongoing investigation. Let's give you a chance to go on record here. Trump did was asked just last month, did he ever James try to pressure Comey into backing off? His answer then, and also succinct. You look no, back. no. Next question. Comey notes that the last time he and Trump spoke, Trump said to him, I've been very loyal to you, very loyal. Within a month, Trump fired him. Tomorrow, Comey will reiterate all of this on Capitol Hill. And then he'll take questions. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And we'll have full coverage of Comey's testimony tomorrow. CBC News Network will take the testimony live at 10 a.m. Eastern. And The National will cover the implications for Trump and the investigations into his campaign's alleged links to Russia. London Bridge has fully reopened after last weekend's attack as the number of confirmed dead today rose to eight. Police pulled a body out of the Thames, believed to be Xavier Thomas of France. Meanwhile, Spain praised the heroism of one of its own. Ignacio Echeverria was killed, but was last seen using a skateboard to defend another person that night on the bridge. All this as the attackers are being thwarted, even in death, by some of their own religion's leaders. The level of anger is such that some imams from a cross-section of Islamic traditions say that these people should be denied an Islamic burial. Hundreds of imams have joined that cause now. Similar stances were taken after the 2008 attacks in Mumbai and the Boston bombing in 2013. At least 12 people are dead after one of the most brutal terror attacks in Iran in years. ISIS is claiming responsibility. But considering the other tensions playing out in the region right now, Iran sees another enemy at fault. Middle East correspondent Derek Stoffel has our story. The first attack targeted the seat of political power in Iran, Parliament. Four men, some dressed in women's clothing, got past security armed with assault rifles and grenades. They went on a rampage inside the halls of this building where lawmakers keep their offices, firing on the street below. Security forces scrambled to rescue those inside, including this boy. Remarkably, members of parliament continued with their legislative business. With the Speaker of the Assembly calling the attack a minor issue. Even while the assault was underway, some lawmakers could not resist the chance to shout, Death to America! The siege at the parliament lasted for hours, but officials say all four of the attackers were killed by security forces. The second incident targeted this shrine where the founder of Iran's revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, is laid to rest. The city's governor says one of the assailants was shot dead by security forces, while the other blew up a suicide device. ISIS claimed responsibility for both attacks, releasing this video appearing to show some of the attackers at parliament and a man who had been shot dead. If the claim is true, it's the first time the so-called Islamic State has brought its brutality to Iran. The Sunni Muslim extremists view Iran's Shia majority as apostates who should be killed. Iranian-backed forces are also at war with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Iran's foreign minister, Javed Zarif, says the attacks will only fortify the resolve of the Iranian people in the fight against terrorism. Later in the day, Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard blamed rival Saudi Arabia for today's attacks, only intensifying the deep regional rift between the kingdom and Iran, and coming just days after the Saudis and other key Arab states isolated Qatar, accusing the tiny Gulf state of supporting Iran, who they see as a sponsor of terror in the region. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. The U.S. has focused its fight in Syria on ISIS, but now a conflict is brewing with forces linked to the Syrian government. 
Today, allies of the Assad regime declared they are prepared to strike U.S. positions in Syria. This after a highly unusual U.S. airstrike. According to the Pentagon, pro-Assad forces were pushing into a zone established to protect a U.S.-run garrison. After warnings, U.S. warplanes hit them. Today by Kurdish forces in Syria, the vanguard of a U.S.-backed push against ISIS' self-proclaimed Syrian capital city of Raqqa. It purportedly shows the Kurdish forces sweeping a village on the western edge of the city, the start of what is likely to be a bloody and prolonged battle. And in Iraq, the battle to push ISIS out of Mosul is now in its eighth month and its final stages. ISIS clings to a single neighborhood. Advances were slow today as coalition forces rescued civilians trapped in that war zone. Thousands have been killed, hundreds of thousands displaced by the fighting. Straight ahead, why nearly half of all refugee claims aren't being heard on time. I'm Teddy, I'm 21 years old, I'm genderqueer, and I use they, them pronouns. My name's Isabella, I'm 27. My name is Willow, um, I'm 20 years old, and I identify as two-spirit, but primarily as a woman. My name is Phoenix, I'm 17, and my, my pronouns are he, him, and Zezer. The hardest part of my journey was um, coming out to my family, um, and also uh, choosing to like accept myself as well. Uh, for a long time, I denied it. it. It's like a step at a time. First, I had to come out to people who I knew would understand, such as some of my, my siblings, some of my younger cousins, and then slowly to some of my younger aunts and uncles, and then eventually to my parents. When I came out the first few times, it was mainly just a living room conversation. I feel like standard, stereotypical a little bit, but um, a few in the car, <laughs> um, the usual. Well, it was kind of a bone chilling event because when I was coming out, I had to have a friend over to, who was already ahead of her transition as a way of trying to give a better impression about what trans people really are. For me personally, I don't think it was as much of an issue as it might have been for some other people just because I already had a precedent. I came out at least four times as four different things before coming out as trans. It's been a constant coming out for me, I think. Like, you know, I'm changing every day and I'm coming out to people multiple times, like, a day. Um, and so, like, it's just... It's been this journey of self-discovery. Slowly asserting, becoming more assertive and standing your ground towards the ones who you know are going to try and deny and trying to refuse to accept the reality. There are some people that I thought would respond positively that didn't and there are some people that I expected to respond negatively that also didn't. So it was kind of a waiting game. In the last federal election, Justin Trudeau's Liberals made taking in refugees a major platform promise, but now a major problem. Because under legislation introduced in 2012, refugee hearings are supposed to be heard within 60 days. And as Karen Pauls tells us, for thousands of asylum seekers, that's just not happening. We picnic, first July. Five months after they first met, Saidu Mohammed and Razak El's lives are still intertwined. Of course, we're going to be friends and we're going to be brothers. The two Ghanaian men didn't know each other before last December. They walked across the border into Canada together on Christmas Eve. Nearly freezing to death in a storm, they lost fingers and thumbs to frostbite. Their hearings before the Immigration and Refugee Board were scheduled three days apart in March. Mohammed's went ahead, but EL's was postponed. So when I 
sleep, I always think about it, always dream about it. So he made me confused every day. The justice delayed is justice denied. Their lawyer says there are two main reasons for the delay, a backlog in security clearance checks and not enough board members to hear all the cases. It's causing a tremendous amount of stress to the refugees in the refugee community across Canada. In the last four months, only 44% of refugee claims were heard on time. Compare that to 2016, when just over half were on schedule. In 2015, 70% were on time. But in that time period, the number of cases have nearly doubled. I think we have to, we have to prove that we have done our best to be as efficient as possible. And if the, uh, the government uh, can afford to give us more resources, I'm sure the government will do so. The board is trying to be more efficient. It has an expedited claims process for countries such as Syria, Burundi and Egypt. Starting this month, it also allows straightforward claims to have a shorter hearing and it's hiring more board members. That's the people. Last month, the IRB accepted Saidu Mohammed's refugee claim. It's changed my life. Like, I was so happy that I got a chance to stay here. I'm very, very happy for him, but I was sitting down and thinking, like, uh, why am I delayed? EL's postponed hearing is supposed to happen next week. He hopes and prays the outcome will be as good as his friends. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. No doubt a lot of parents in Toronto experienced a jolt of raw fear this morning after hearing that a school bus transporting special needs kids was T-boned hard enough to flip it over. The accident left students hanging by their seatbelts. Witnesses rushed to help the children and the driver off the bus. Luckily, no major injuries. Five children were taken to hospital, though. So was the bus driver. The driver of the SUV that hit them faces a charge of careless driving. Montreal moved today to change the rules for the city's horse-drawn carriages or caleches. It wants to train drivers and make sure the horses don't work too long or in extreme heat. The decision comes after several high-profile incidents that seem to show the horses getting hurt. Rice, soy, almond... Canadian families are drinking a variety of different kinds of milks these days. The result of allergies, well-being, trends and concerns about animal rights. But a new study suggests not all things called milk are created equal. And that cow's milk offers a slight edge, height. Christine Birak explores the findings. Everest milk? That's fortified yeah. soy milk. Andrea Thompson is raising her daughter on a vegan diet. Everest has never sipped cow's milk. Children are not baby cows, and therefore they shouldn't be drinking the breast milk of another species. She's not alone in her thinking. Researchers say a growing number of Canadians are turning to milk alternatives. But a new study shows kids who drink cow's milk are taller than those who don't. What difference that makes to adult height is not clear at the present time, um, but the difference um, at three years of age is detectable and, and not tiny. Researchers studied more than 5,000 Canadian kids between the ages of two and six. About 13% of them were consuming cow's milk alternatives, including rice, soy, almond and goat's milk. Researchers say on average, at three years old, the kids drinking cow's milk were a centimetre and a half taller. We shouldn't just say that cow's milk itself is, is this magical, uh, no pun intended, formula to, to help your child to become taller. Genetics and overall diet are far more critical in determining growth. And while they all offer relatively the same amount of calcium, pediatricians say this study has them thinking about the nutritional content of milk alternative products. The, the amount of protein in, in some of these products is about 25% versus in cow's milk, uh, 100%. So it's a big difference. Cow's milk is standardized. So when a pediatrician recommends three cups a day, it doesn't matter which brand you buy. You'll end up getting the same amount of calories, fat, and protein. That is not the case for its substitutes. The same amount of soy, depending on the brand, will give you less calories, fat, and protein. Pediatricians say over time, kids can end up consuming less than what's recommended for optimal growth. You're happy and you know Thompson says she consulted hands. a dietitian to supplement her daughter's diet with other foods because happy and healthy is every parent's goal. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto.
An update now to a story we brought you last night about some Air Canada customers having tickets cancelled without warning. Air Canada has now reinstated the ticket for one of the people in our story and is looking into the issue to see that it doesn't happen again. Could calling a snap election backfire tomorrow for the British Prime Minister? Margaret Evans has more on the rocky election campaign from London. And Neil Fuxel in Cyprus, where time is running out to solve some deadly mysteries. That's all still ahead on The National.
In just a matter of hours now, Britons will get their chance to choose who will lead their country. When this snap election was called in April, there was a clear frontrunner. But in politics, two months is an eternity. And from fox hunting to video stunts to terror attacks, the dynamics have changed. Margaret Evans takes us through it all. Jeremy Corbyn! <laughs> What a difference a month makes. Over the past few weeks of campaigning, Britain's election has gone from a foregone conclusion, predicting a landslide win for Theresa May, to the possibility, however slight, that a man whose critics dismiss as leader of the loony left could actually become Britain's next prime minister. Thank you very much. Jeremy Corbyn surprised the country by winning the Labour Party leadership in 2015 after 30 years as a backbencher. He struggled to win the respect of his own party, not to mention the governing Conservatives on the other side of the House. He can lead a protest. I'm leading a country. Thank you very much. Goodbye. A series of public relations disasters has made him fodder for the media. Traingate was one of the worst. This is a problem that many passengers face every day on the train. Supporters filmed him sitting on the floor of a Virgin train last summer, saying he couldn't find a seat, proof that Britain's trains should be renationalized. The train company called his bluff, releasing a video of Corbyn walking past empty seats and later sitting down. He's taken hits for refusing to sing God Save the Queen, has been labelled Comrade Corbyn, and suffered the indignity of a mass revolt in his own caucus. Measure. Here's what former Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock had to say in an interview last and year so about the likelihood of Corbyn ever being now. Prime Minister. I've watched him for 12 months. He cannot do the job. But despite all that, Corbyn has managed to turn in a strong and vibrant campaign performance, playing up comparisons to Bernie Sanders as a politician of the people. Big one. Especially compared to his opponent, Theresa May. So how do you manage to go from a 20-point lead down to somewhere between six and three, especially when Jeremy Corbyn gave such a fumbling start to his campaign? For starters, say analysts, May hasn't managed to convince voters she cares about ordinary folks, particularly since she announced she'll reinstate fox hunting. It confirms what they already thought about the Conservatives, They're often associated with being a bit posh, uh, rich, elitist, out of touch. Tom Clarkson is with WorldThinks, a research firm. He says May hasn't performed well with people on the doorstep. I think she lacks warmth, whereas Jeremy Corbyn has, has outperformed uh, very, very low expectations on, uh, on that front. Uh, people thought he would be a disaster, and he's, he's not proven to be a disaster. Go for it. Elect a Labour government. Thank you so much. He's clearly changed some minds. A wicked one. Cheers, mother. Cheers, mum. I don't know how he'd do as Prime Minister necessarily, but I think he seems to be quite a values-driven politician, which feels rare at the moment. Any time he's in front of a lectern or on a soapbox, He's got passion, he's got conviction. She's a liar, liar. She's a liar, liar. No, you can't trust her. No, no, no, no. This song is one of the most popular in the United Kingdom just now. Some notable flip flops have hurt the Prime Minister. I'm not going to be calling a snap election. She's campaigned on the slogan of strong and stable leadership. Strong and stable leadership. Strong and stable leadership. Strong and stable leadership. Strong it's a slogan the Conservatives leadership. have played up in the wake of the two terrorist attacks that have taken place on British soil over the course of this campaign. Security, who best can deliver it, has become one of the central themes of the election. May has gone after Corbyn's past, accusing him of supporting the IRA. But May is seen as vulnerable because she was in charge of cuts to the police as Home Secretary. It's not clear yet what the impact of that is on, on tomorrow's vote, um, but certainly that issue is, is sort of playing both ways. And so too is the campaign in the end. Analysts quick to point out that Corbyn's late surge might not translate into a victory tomorrow. But the choice is there. One voter's sinner, after all, is another's saint. And the polls 
have been wrong before. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. While Brexit is a newer nationalist movement causing divisions, when we come back, one country's struggle that goes back decades. First, a look at the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped 92 points. The dollar fell two-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 37 points. The price of oil closed down $2.47 a barrel. Good evening from London. It was a glittering and magnificent ceremony here at historic St. Paul's Cathedral, the marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. It was as if all of London was in love. 600,000 people filling the streets come to share a special day. As they cheered every carriage, and as they listened quietly to the ceremony on the speakers, I pronounce that they be man and wife together. They were, quite simply, rejoicing. These things. I love royal weddings and royal anything. Yes, it's Britain, isn't it? It's Britain. Yeah. We're here because we're English, we're British. This is a great day for us. The crowd in front of me today has been uh, absolutely marvellous. They've enjoyed themselves watching the procession and uh, they seem to have enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a time to forget all the troubles and anyone who tried to bring them up didn't have a chance. It's good for the country. That's it's good it in for a the nutshell. country, yeah. It's good but for ordinary people like me who go to work every day. And yeah, thousands and millions of other jobs? people like us, all right? What about people good that haven't got jobs? I enjoy it. What about it's fellas like me as well? What about fellas like it's me? It's just for the ordinary working people who go to work every day who've got a job, all right? We're lucky we've got a job. Yeah, this is marvellous. This is England. Not only the British thought it was marvellous, the Trudeau children watched from Canada House with their mother. Um, well, I thought it was like a fairy tale. And like... Um... The, the trumpets and the band and and the um, Prince Charles was the prince and Lady Diana was the princess and and was very happy. What did you think of Lady Diana? I think she was very beautiful and I'm glad that Prince Charles has picked her. He has made a very good choice. Misha, what did you think of the whole thing? I think the band was nice. I'm a musician myself, so. I would think it's nice all the time. Lady Diana was nice, Charles was nice, the church was nice, the queen was nice. Not just the children, but all the world seems captivated by the beautiful princess in her magnificent dress. She's beautiful, she had lovely frills around here. Like a lemon colour, didn't yeah. it? Lemony cream, it wasn't white. Exactly. Even as they saw it, this London fashion house was copying it. Frantically working from a sketch made the moment the bride appeared on television. Ours is white, hers was ivory, more to cream. Secondly, really the important thing is we are not using pure silk, we're using artificial silk, and um, therefore it's a lot cheaper than Lady Diana's Princess of Wales dress would be if one could buy it, which of course you can't. Within hours, three copies of the dress will be in London stores. Within days, thousands. The wedding has obviously been a tremendous boost for the British fashion industry and for the British economy. And also, perhaps above all, even if only fleetingly, for a faltering British spirit. Eve Savory, CBC News, London. I am an immigrant, and I am a Canadian, and in this weird sort of political time, the portrayal of an immigrant family on a national broadcaster doing what all families do, which is try to make a life for themselves through the laughter, through the tears, is so much more important now than ever before. Because it normalizes us, and it shows other people that we might have some cultural differences, but deep down inside, when it comes to family, we are all the same, and that our strength has been and always will be diversity in this country, and I've never been more proud to be a Canadian than right now. Don't let the beautiful landscape fool you. 
Cyprus is a country that understands the rising tide of nationalism we've been witnessing right around the world. Like in Britain, Europe and the U.S., hate has caused deep divisions there. But in Cyprus, the pain goes back so far, people can't seem to move past it. As the CBC's Neil Cooksell tells us, it's a country that's still haunted by its secrets and scars. There is a sentence you'll hear more than once on Cyprus. That there is everything here and nothing all at once. The Mediterranean ease and charm, island life. Fields of fertile land Cypriots have always had to fight to hold on to. The countryside here in Cyprus is beautiful. You can smell the flowers and the herbs in the air, but the soil here still holds dark secrets. The secrets are buried all over this island, but the scars of war are still in plain sight. Those scars and secrets seem to sabotage the island's plans for peace every time. Secrets and scars tie Andriani Elia to this tiny space. Never really home or at peace since 1974. That's when her son disappeared. For Salahi Uchka, every peak Every field on this island he loves holds the worst kinds of possibilities. He's been in a constant state of searching since childhood. Bir baba ama ben babanın e, duygusal olarak kim olduğunu bilerek büyümedim. Evde bir baba nedir e, bilmiyorum. The years have convinced them both their loved ones are not coming home. But where are they? What really happened to them? Only one of these Cypriots will get the answers they're desperate for. This work can be excruciating. Their eyes are constantly searching. Even the smallest fragments they find can help rebuild lives. We are not finding pottery or we are not finding house stone. We are finding human, we are finding bones. They are archaeologists, and this is one of eight sites dedicated to finding the dead. The Committee on Missing Persons is made up of Greek and Turkish Cypriots working together in a place where some have been taught to hate and forced to live apart. Like most of her colleagues, Rusana Theokli has dedicated a decade of her life to this work. It's a feeling that what we are doing, it has a main and a common cause. It's not yours or mine, or we don't separate these things, never. But everything has been separate here for more than 40 years, after Greek and Turkish Cypriots, neighbors on this island, began turning on each other. <laughs> Fighting divided the island into north and south. In the summer of 1974, Greek nationalism was soaring. The group, known as Ayoka, staged a coup on the island with support from Athens. The goal was to join Cyprus with Greece. Turkish troops landed on the island that July. Greek Cypriots saw it as an invasion. But Turkey insists it was there to intervene, to protect the Turkish Cypriot minority from the coup. For them, the war had started long before 1974. By the 1960s, British rule had ended, but the impact of divide and conquer was clear. The brief period of peace between Turkish and Greek Cypriots as they governed themselves started to crumble, and Cypriots started to disappear. Today, you won't find a great wall separating this island's two sides, but Cyprus is divided. One side for Turkish Cypriots, the other for Greek Cypriots and the UN buffer zone in between. The CMP lab sits in that protected zone, but inside, borders 
are brushed aside. The scientists here have identified 700 sets of remains so far, victims from both deadly periods and both sides of the conflict. And these remains on this table that you can see uh, were located in the same burial, uh, but the burial was disturbed. So here you cannot see a complete skeleton. It can take the CMP up to three years from excavation to DNA analysis to identify a set of remains. Some families will get a full coffin, others just a small box. For us it's a success when we can identify a person okay, on a scientific level, but mainly it's successful uh, because you know that one more family will have an answer. So it, emotionally, it's, uh, it's rewarding, I, I can say mm -hmm. that. Uh, and also then, because after we identify a person, what you can see from the bones, then you have the real information, and then these bones actually become a real person. Real people, not politics or peace talks, are the priority here. No one takes sides. But there is an enemy, time. Witnesses who've kept secret what they've seen for years are dying. Adgin Konuksevar's career has called on him to bear witness more than once. He was already an experienced war photographer when he landed on Cyprus in 1974. He snapped these images as Turkish soldiers captured five Greek Cypriot troops. The lieutenant had a message for his captives. Korkmayın dedi, bir şey olmayacak size dedi. Söyledi yani işte, size bir şey olmayacak dedi. Korkmayın, ne istersiniz dedi falan. They were safe, until Turkish Cypriot village fighters arrived. Bir şeylere, mücahitlere anlatamadım bunu. Mücahitler hepsini burada öldürdü. It, it, goes, it goes like hell. Everything, the bombs, they are coming like a rain. So it was a hell. Andreas Demetriades was a surgeon, readying his hospital for the barrage of victims pouring in. In that hell, the journalist and the doctor would define what Cyprus was and could be. Ölüme götürüyor bizi. Bizi dedim ölüme götürüyor. Bak dedim ben sana söyleyeyim. Daha bir lafım bitti. Bir ateş başladı. Arabanın ön camından bir mermi girdi içeri. Konuk Sever was shot and taken to a Greek Cypriot hospital. There, the people tasked with keeping him alive attacked. Birkaç tane hemşire kadın falan beni yumruklamaya başladı yattım yani. Türk gelmiş, Türk gelmiş diye yumrukluyorlardı. I rushed and I pushed everybody away and I told them let this man, don't bother him. We, I am a doctor. I have the oath of Hippocrates, and from now on, you do your job. The journalist was eventually whisked away by aid workers who took him back to Turkey. The doctor returned to the countless emergencies before him. The two would not meet again until 2009, 35 years after that night in the hospital. He embraced me, he cried, I cry, it changed my life as a human being. The pair's story is legendary. Fate forced them together, but they chose to make peace. Travel north, though, and you'll find a different example of what war has left behind in Cyprus. This town, Kirenia, called Girne in Turkish, like the entire northern part of this island, is not recognized by any international body as a country. World powers still see Turkey's presence as an invasion. That means heavy sanctions and restrictions for people here. No flights arrive in northern Cyprus from anywhere in the world except Turkey. Mail can't come here directly either. It has to be routed through Turkey first. Here, they've not had any of the benefits of the European Union Greek Cypriots living less than an hour south have had. Kirenia was a key port for the island and the place Turkish troops first landed back in 1974. 
It's also the place many Cypriots lost their loved ones. Salahi Uchkan's dad was 28 when he disappeared. He'd left their village to buy groceries in Kirenia. He was taken by Greek Cypriots. Benim 52 yıl bir tarafım esir yaşadı. Babam kayboldu. Ben büyüdüm. Bu yaşa geldim ve onu hala bulamadım. Bir sorumluluk, bir e, hüzün çöker içinize. E, pişmanlık duyarsınız, üzüntü duyarsınız, vicdan azabı duyarsınız. Niye ben babamı hala bulamadım? Teftamekhami. Andriani Elia was forced to move several times in her 81 years. But Kirenia was her home and the place she last saw her son alive. 19-year-old Elias was a conscripted soldier, killed when he was confronted by Turkish troops. The CMP still has more than a thousand people to find and identify. Finding full sets of remains at this site is unlikely, at least for now. Too much has happened here. The field has been cultivated twice a year regularly since 1974. We are going to find them. They are here. They are somewhere. So it's our aim to find them. One day, perhaps. But Andriani Elia is still waiting. Hundreds of others are waiting too. Trading stories of the missing is a sad routine here. But Salahi Uchkan finally has a different story to tell. 52 sene geçmiş. Bölgede binlerce ev yapılmış. O kadar kazı yapılmış. Bunların altında bir temelin altında da olabilirdi. Yani mümkün değil diye bakardık artık yani çok. It was a witness and the work of the CMP that delivered what Uchkan calls a miracle. His father's remains were found alongside his friends in the very same car they'd left home in. They were shot by Greek Cypriot fighters. The car and their bodies dumped in a copper quarry and covered up. İlk kez babamla tanışmam o çukurun içinde oldu, o kemiklerin yanında oldu. Ağladım, bütün vücudumun titrediğini hissettim. Yani alışmış olduğum bir duygu değildi. He was buried here on Christmas Day, the same day he was shot in 1963. O boşluğu işte buraya gelip e, konuşuyoruz. Neyi konuşuyoruz? Onca sene konuşamadıklarımızı tek taraflı olarak anlatıyoruz. Baba diyebiliyorum. Ben hayatım boyunca baba diyemedim. He finally feels free. But for many on this island, words still get in the way. Fear and mistrust are so deeply ingrained. But now there's a fresh chance for peace. The Turkish and Greek Cypriot leaders are back at the negotiating table. Tensions between them forced a two-month break in the meetings, which have already been running for two years. Others have been close before. Greek Cypriots rejected a plan the UN helped secure in 2004. So why a new push now? That is tightly tied to Cyprus's other secrets. Europe, Turkey and Israel all want a piece of the natural gas under these waters. The access and pipelines they dream of cannot happen unless there is reunification. Whatever the politicians can and can't do, Cypriots are trying to find peace in their own ways, slowly. And there's been some progress. Border crossings like this one are open across the island. Greek and Turkish Cypriots can cross into north and south. But the fact they have to carry passports to travel inside their own country stings. Still, not enough, though, it seems, to agree to finally lift all of the barriers between them. And even if their leaders agree to a deal at the negotiating table, Cypriots will once again have the power to decide whether to accept it in a referendum. Will Cypriots finally bet on peace? Cyprus guards its secrets too well. 
Neil Kirksall, CBC News, Nicosia. The National returns in a few moments. Stay with us. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, you can either love it or leave it. But seven years ago, Uber came out of nowhere to dominate the alternative to taxis around the world. Adam Lashinsky details Uber's wild ride on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. They have never seen anything like it around the Lincoln Memorial or, for that matter, anywhere else here in the capital of the United States. We lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. This park area on the Washington Mall, right underneath the Capitol Dome, has been the gathering place for many demonstrations but none quite so strange as this collection of uniformed veterans complete with medals and toy machine guns. The anti-war movement in this country is an ever-changing phenomenon. You never know quite what to expect next. William H. Carroll from Atlanta, Georgia. 26 air medals and all the other stuff that goes with it. Washington was the scene today of the largest anti-nuclear demonstration ever held in the U.S. If you're not building for the future, you're stealing from it. They call the Supreme Court decision a tragic mistake. And on this, the 10th anniversary of legalized abortions, 26,000 marchers vowed to begin a second decade of protest. Organizers are calling it the biggest pro-choice rally in history. We will never give up. We will never give up. We will never give in. Capitol Hill to the Washington Monument, they formed an awesome mass of people. Not the million and a half the organizers claimed, but the largest ever gathering of black Americans. We're not here to tear down America. America is tearing itself down. We are here to rebuild the wasted cities. This was exactly the image organizers wanted a pageant of Americans before a national icon. Summoned by a political commentator and a champion of conservatives. This day is a day that we can start the heart of America again. Look around you, you're not alone. You are Americans. The National. The National. Tonight. This season on When Calls the Heart. Dreams have been known to come true. Looking to build a house for your new family? I don't know what to think right now. Mom. In the flesh. When Calls the Heart. New season begins Sunday, June 18th on CBC. This amazing gesture is the icing on the cake. By no means is this the end. The curtain has not yet fallen. It's simply stuck. The driver will be okay, but it says something. There was more sympathy for his cargo. Cases of beer pouring from the truck that tipped over on an exit ramp. But as in all times of chaos, heroes step up, even when it's light beer. This hero warning others to stay away so he and other so-called professionals could start the cleanup. <laughs> How's that for a note to end it on? That's The National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Diana Swain. Thanks for watching.